Okay, I feel like I've been waiting to do this interview my whole life. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> like, real talk, I, I'm sitting next to black royalty right now. Lord this man mercy. walking the door, and I feel like black Jesus just entered. Oh my God! Uh, let me tell. Let me say once again. I hate to cut you off. Thank you for this interview because I heard that you do all of the best, all of the, the hip hop people, all of them, and a, a lot of OGs. People call me OG, but you have been dealing with some real OGs, okay? And I appreciate you having me on your show, man. Absolutely, absolutely. I'm, I'm, I'm gonna tell you because I want to intro you right because I feel like I'm sitting in the midst of, <laughs> of. <laughs> I mean, truth be told, and I know you hear this all the time, it feels like I've been knowing you my entire life. Like, like you feel that familiar to me. So you walking in the door, it, it, it feels, like I said, black royalty, black Hollywood elite, or uh, Hollywood elite, actor, writer, comedian. I, I mean, you, this singer, man, singer, he does it all. As well. I'm a singer, composer as well. Singing I composer. started off with Harry Belafonte. You know who he is? Oh, we're going to get into that. Absolutely. Okay. Mr. B. But talking about Hollywood, the reason why I'm here probably because you did not go to the 35th uh, precinct in Hollywood where I got a lot of warrants. <laughs> and I want to ask you, will this be shown in Louisiana? It will be shown all over the world, my brother. Oh, God. Our sheriff is looking for my ass in Louisiana <laughs> right now, okay? Because I got warrants there, too. I visit my hometown, New Orleans, about oh, a couple of times a year, and I make sure I go there at night. <laughs> Come on, man. You ain't got no open warrants down there. Yes, I do. <laughs> oh, hold on. Can, 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 I, can I finish this? Please welcome to Vlad TV, Mr. Garrett Morris. Garrett, what up, brother? Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Sean. I appreciate it. Absolutely. Absolutely. I'm, I'm looking forward to this interview. You're looking good. I told you offline. You're looking, you, you, you got the black don't crack, brother. Like, you're like, you really got it <laughs> done right. You know what I say? I say, good black don't crack. Good brown stays around. Good uh, uh, yellow stays mellow. Good beige, it don't age. And good white is I. Right. Ah, you know I ain't never heard that. I'm <laughs> I'm gonna uh, uh copyright that because somebody's gonna say they thought of it first. Exactly. Make sure you copyright that. I think I am copywriting it. Yes. <laughs> oh my god. Okay, let's take this thing back to the beginning. Yes. You 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 from you from New Orleans. Great Town, New Orleans, which is the 19th ward. When you say Great Town, people think you're talking about another town. No. Gertown is the 19th ward in New Orleans, and there was a guy, white guy named something Gert, and he got his name, but um, it was the 19th ward, and it was as bad as the 9th ward has a reputation for being, because uh, people were getting killed every other night there. Uh, but uh, I, I'm blessed to have been born. Now, I believe I was blessed to have been born in New Orleans, even if it was the 19th war, because right now I see New Orleans as one of the greatest cities in this country. Yeah, yes, it is. Any, very different from any other city. Yeah, very different from any other city and some of the best food on planet Earth. Oh, my like, God. Oh, my God. And both of my grandmothers, matter of fact, all the ladies and some of the men in my family could lay it down. Because in New Orleans... Some of the men cook as well as the women. And, uh, and my, both my grandmothers, one of my grandmothers, uh, my father's mother, has me hooked on crab cakes to this day. Because mm. she, oh my God, she sit down on crab cakes. But uh, being born in, in Great Town, I was born the uh, grandson of a Baptist minister uh, whose name was uh, Thomas Phillips. And his wife, my grandmother, Gertrude Phillips, Basically, I'm lucky that they were the ones who raised me from the time I was born to the time I was like 13. At 13, I went to my father's side of the family, which was tragedy. But the first 13 years, uh, you know, to this day, I, I give my grandfather credit for what I am now. Because as a minister, he would write his sermon during the week. That meant him a writer. 
He would mm-hmm. preach his sermon on Sunday. That made him an actor because he was one of those whooping preachers. Uh, he was also a singer. He had a beautiful tenor voice. Uh, he directed the junior choir and the senior choir. That made him a director. And he was a composer who has a song right now. When you go to any Protestant church, those books in the back of the pews mm-hmm. has a song my grandfather wrote called He's My Everything. So my grandfather was a writer, actor, singer, composer, director. What am I? I'm a writer, actor, singer, composer. Okay, I never directed, but I owe really what I am now largely to me emulating my grandfather. Wow. And you said, what am I now? And I was about to say all the above. Yes. Like, wow. Yeah. How about that? Yeah. How Tell about so. that? Did you sing in the choir? Oh, my God. He had me singing at the age of four. Because I had mm. one of those Vienna, Vienna choir boys voices, right? So I was singing first tenor in a quartet that traveled around Louisiana. But also I sang in both the senior choir and the, the junior choir because I was musically... Um, uh, what's the word? Um, Inclined. Yeah, yeah, from from a very early age. So yeah, he had me doing it before I even walked down the aisle at seven and became a Christian, which I am not now. I'm a Buddhist. But before I became a Christian even, I was already singing gospel music in a quartet at four years old. How about that? Yeah. You know, you you just tapped on something. We we take you. I'm I'm gonna bring it back there because I would love to know what made you convert from being a Christian to a Buddhist. That is a story. You want to know that story? Yeah, let, let's go into it. Okay. Because, remember I told you at the age of 13, uh, my grandmother had died and my grandfather broke my heart because not only was he fooling around with the organist of the church mm. and making her pregnant, he also, Aww. on the week, was filling a lot of the female members of the church with the Holy Spirit. <laughs> okay? So I was a very naive, very 100% Christian until mm-hmm. I began to deal with what he was doing and some of his minister friends would do it. And by the time I was in my late teens, I was aware that Christianity had also played a role in the 350 years of slavery, and that when I was growing up in the 40s, the white Christian community was heavy behind segregation and was not dealing with lynchings, which were happening, I thought, two or three times a month. I found out the statistics for lynchings was two or three times a week. By the time I'm in my 20s, I'm... I'm ashamed to be a Christian because not only did I find that out, but I found out also one one time from my grandfather that Jesus himself was not white and blonde haired. He was, in fact, a brown skinned man with woolly hair. If you go to Revelation, the first chapter, 14 and 15 verse, you'll see that. So by the time I'm in my 20s, I'm actually angry that I'm a Christian, right? So I was determined not to be a Christian. But I wasn't telling anybody because if I told that to anybody, then I was still immersed in it. Uh, they would have kicked my behind. So when I left um, uh, New Orleans to go to New York, it was because of I had won a, a voice, a, a singing contest which sent me to Philadelphia. And then after that, the chaperone said they would, I, I won second place in Philadelphia. But after that, the chaperone would say she would send us to uh, to New York for a tour. Mm-hmm. I told my grandmother, who's my father's mother, this before I left, and I I hope, look, you're not supposed to talk against, bad about grandmother, it's, it's almost biblical, right? But this grandmother was very, very, very on the other side. My mother's father was like uh, the very example of non-unconditional uh, love. My father mm-hmm. was, uh, mother was not. So when I told her I would leave, make a long story short, when I left, my father's mother cursed me. She, her exact words were, I curse you and you will fail. If you don't listen to me, everything you do is going to fail. When I got to New York, um, I went to my aunt to stay there. 
a boy. I'm telling you the truth. And my aunt had been called by my grandmother, and my grandmother told her not to let me stay there. Oh, no. So I wound up being put out on the street, and for the next six weeks to two months, I was homeless. Meanwhile, I had read a book by another Christian, uh, Norman Vincent Peale. You might have read it, The Power of Positive Thinking. Absolutely. I read that book and became convinced that what he was really saying to me was that there was something inside of me that if I dealt with it, it would deliver me. So for six weeks, I kept imagining myself with a house, living somewhere with a job, and I did it every night while I was homeless. I'm sleeping on the um, top of projects, and I'm sleeping uh, in New York. There are those uh, downstairs apartments, or you walk down a brick uh, stairway and around the side. I'm sleep there, and mm -hmm. but every mm -hmm. night I'm imagining myself not homeless with a house to stay in, with a job. And I did it for like three weeks, and I was stopped by a black cop who. Uh, was very kind to me. He said, look, man, your vagrant is against the law. I should bring you in, but I'm not. And I happened to tell him that I was a college graduate. And we talked a little while. He said, look, man, stop doing that. You can't do that. You can't sleep on the top of uh, projects, et cetera. But of course, what can I do, Sean? I told him I wouldn't do it because I did it again. Mm -hmm, the mm -hmm. next time I was stopped by his sergeant, a white sergeant. Uh, and I, I never forget it. I was on the ceiling sleeping. And a black woman comes through the door. There he is. There he is. And the sergeant handcuffed me, took me downstairs, gave it to the black cop, and somebody had dropped a dime on him. And he tells the black cop, this time you take him to jail, which he did. So over the weekend, I'm sleeping in the, in, in the tank, and I am still, still imagining myself with a home to stay in, with a job. I didn't stop. I kept on till Monday morning when I was in court, right? And the travel age man was sitting next to me and the travel age man said, you people come here from all around, you just want to live on welfare. And that was the last thing I wanted to do. But now I'm crying because finally I'm saying all of that stuff I did did not work. Then the cop goes up to the judge and I see something I'd never seen before in my life. You know what I saw? Hmm. A black judge. Wow. wow. His, name was, his name was Kenneth W. Stamps. And if you go to your phone right now and put his name down, it will come up. He was a very progressive activist judge. And when the black cop talked to him, he, he said, oh, really? He calls me up. He said, I understand you're a college graduate. I said, yes. He said, what, what college? I said, Dillard University. He said, now nah, he still doesn't believe me. He said, who's your president? I said, Albert W. Dent. And what I didn't know was, about two weeks before, Eisenhower, probably with me in mind, had called a convention of black college presidents and black lawyers. And he had met Albert W. Dent and knew wow. I was telling the truth. And you know what he said then? Take that boy to my chambers. And I went to his office, sat there crying now for another reason, because I really, some epiphany is going on. And I realized that thing I had been doing was working. Sure enough, he comes to his office and he gets on the phone, doesn't say a word to me, gets on the phone, calls the YMCA, and they agreed to let me stay in the YMCA until I got a job. And when I went there, I was firmly convinced that there was something inside me. Actually, I was practicing a religion, Buddhism, and I didn't know that, because it took me a couple of decades later when I became a Buddhist. I, from my friend Art Evans, you know who Art Evans is? No, He no, was one no. of the stars of Soldier Story and his wife, Babe Evans. But I didn't know that part of Nishiran Buddhism is imagery. You chant each morning and each evening, use the imagery about what you want to do, what goal you want. I didn't know that. All I, I thought it was positive thinking. And for the next two or three decades, I used positive thinking in all of the stuff I did, not knowing until I met 
really got down with Art Evans that was a part of Nichiren Buddhism. I hope that's certainly not too long. What? That, no, no. What an amazingly beautiful story. Yeah. I, yeah. Matter of fact, I'm working on my autobiography right now. If Providence gives me enough time, I'm going to finish it. Oh, man. What an amazingly beautiful story. And, and I'm so happy you told it because somebody needs to hear this. Yeah, yeah. You know, people people have a tendency to think where they are right now, their circumstances, uh, the hand that life has dealt them at this moment yeah. is going to be the way that the rest of their days play out. Right, that's karma. Yes, it is. Yeah. And, you know, it, it, it all starts with, with the mind and what's within you, what you believe. Right. It's not your circumstances. You, you know, you just called... That that black judge by name. Yes. Oh. Kenneth W. Stamps. I swear, if you go to your computer or your phone, his name will come up. And by the way, I mentioned it to some black lawyers of mine at a party. And they uh -huh. said, yeah, Kenneth W. Stamps. Yeah, because everybody knows him. He was an activist judge in the 50s, man. And he, along with another judge whose name was Bruce Marion Wright. You might know Bruce because to this day he had a nickname called Cut 'em Loose Bruce. Because if you mm. were in it, if you were on the left of a political situation, you white, black, yellow, I don't care, green. If he if you got in Bruce's a court, court he knew any way to let you go, he would let you go. So the cops hated his guts and started <laughs> calling him Cut 'em Loose Blues. But uh, Kenneth W. Stamps and Bruce Marion White right were doing it correctly uh, because they were judges who had the power and they were not afraid to do the right thing. Okay. So I got to ask you about Mr. Stamps, um, judge stamps. Yeah. He, he, he essentially changed your life. Absolutely. Um, Absolutely. He, he, you, you were sleeping on rooftops. You were sleeping uh, in alleyways basement. behind the buildings. Yes. And, and this man set you up. When when he could have he sure sentenced could've. you, so I, I, I have have you ever had the opportunity to see him years later to when say it's I, me? When I was working with Harry Belafonte as a singer arranger, I would call him all the time to thank him and say, "Look, Harry's going to be at Palace Theater. Harry's going to be here." He would never accept it. He wanted me to understand. He just did it because he thought it was right, and I owed him nothing. He would never let me. I On the phone, I got a chance to st thank him more than one time. But he mm -hmm, never mm -hmm. would let me do anything to really show him how grateful I was for what he had done. Because he didn't have to do it. Uh, when the cop told him I was a college graduate, he could say, okay, oh, hey, so what? Let him go back to New York. He didn't do that. And I had the impression I wasn't the only one that got was benefited from his attitude amazing amazing yeah. um you you know you 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 just spoke about mr b harry belafonte yes uh how, how did you connect and be part of the the, the belafonte folk singers how, well, how does that happen that i'm gonna tell you because when i was at the ymca i used to go downstairs and then i was singing you know a lot of classical music, so you have to practice every day, right? So mm -hmm. I was practicing one day, and one of the members of the Belafonte Singers also practiced there. His name was Ned Wright. And he heard <laughs> me singing. And he said, hey, man, there's a job for you with the Belafonte Singers. I think he's kidding me. I said, no. He said, no, go on audition. I sure I went to audition, and that's how I got my first job. So what Kenneth W. Stamps did led me to that right and my first job in the business. Yeah. Amazing. And I, and I was a single ranger with him for like, oh, nine years. Now, I was the youngest member, and you got to understand, competition for getting your arrangements done was fierce. So in nine years, he only did one of my arrangements. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. But I, I was a singer with him for nine years. But the, the fact that you worked that closely with him um, and all that he meant to oh my god, 
the world and the civil rights oh, movement and God. black people. That that and you're a young boy at this time. You, you're like very 20, young man. I was like twenty. I got the job at twenty two. Yeah, twenty two. And uh, I, oh my God, he was in my. Not only was there physically all the time talking and giving speeches uh, with with Martin and them, he gave his money as well. Yes, yes. Yeah. Uh, he was he was dynamite. Yeah, you know, and obviously you were there. I wasn't, but he put his money where his mouth was. Where his he mouth put was, his yes. career on the line, sure and, and from what I understand. You know, he would he would allow them to meet in his home when he, they came he, up to New York City. Yes, he sure would. You know, the, the, back in them days, taking a stand like that, it had to be, and I couldn't imagine it because you, and and this is why I was so grateful to to be allowed to sit with you today because oh, wow. when you you come from an era like if if we turn on the television now. There are so many different shades of our people, of black people. Yes. But when you guys were coming up, they, they, you, you'd you be hard-pressed to find any people of color on TV. They might accept one here, right. one there. Right. And when, 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 when those guys did make it in and them young ladies did make it in, to put it all on the line for something greater than themselves, I, I I just think that that's absolutely amazing. That that you know, whether it's a it's a it's a Harry Belafonte, uh, 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 Muhammad Ali, um, Dick Gregory, Luau Cinder, D D Dick Gregory, yeah. whoever it might be, to say, look, you know, I'm I'm for, I know that that this could have terrible backlash on yeah. on my career. Yeah. But but I'm I'm black first, and 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 I understand the struggles that our people are going through. Yeah, and wow. I, even, even though I've made it in the case of Harry, I'm not forgetting where I came from. There you go. Yeah, yeah. Hmm. Okay. Um. You 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 go from there, and you start working on Broadway. How how did that come about for you? Well, I actually before that. I was um, working, because working with Harry was like a six-month thing. Six months mm -hmm. on, six months off. So I mm -hmm. would work in uh, off-Broadway and in um, workshops. I worked with um, another other than, he was Leroy Jones then, but he became Imam Yamiri Baraka. And I worked in the Black Arts Theater, which he had on 125th Street. I also worked um, downtown with uh, Woody King at Henry Street Settlement. And I did at least 10 to 15 off-Broadway shows down there with Henry Street. Uh, and I did maybe a couple of Broadway shows as well uh, prior to, and I also wrote a couple of plays. Um, one of my plays was a play called uh, The Secret Place, which was about that guy. Remember the black guy who infiltrated the uh, um, Black Panthers? Yes, yes. And he, uh, you know, I just read about him. Um... You you talking about out in um Chicago? He was he was uh damn yeah, but 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 and and his name escapes me. But go ahead, I know exactly his name escapes you're me about. too. And he remember he, I uh, understand he killed himself. But prior to that, right, me and Bill Duke got this thing together, uh, which was produced over oh, three or four times in New York City, and my play was this is before he killed himself was more about knowing that a black man who's about my age is infiltrating black groups. And I know he's come from the South like me. He knows what's really happening. And he's infiltrating basically being, you know, an ear for white cops. And I wondered mm -hmm. what he was going to in his head. So my play is about the nightmares that he was having doing his job, right? Uh, but getting off of that play, I had written that play and sure enough, Tubman Howard I got um, to TV. Um, Lauren Michaels with um, Fred Hudson, a guy named uh, Fred Hudson, who had also had a workshop, um, said, hey, Lauren Michaels, uh, he didn't start calling him, that's a producer who wants um, a black guy to be in the, in, in the mix, right? And sure enough, uh, I brought Lauren my play 
he read it, and there were a couple of funny scenes in it, and he hired me as a writer, not as a actor. And my job was to come up with something funny in writing and also to bring in other actors because Lauren also wanted a black person on the Not Ready for Primetime Players. Mm-hmm, so I'm mm-hmm. bringing in people like oh, Oba Baba Tunde, Bill Duke, Trezana Beverly, who was a uh, Tony Award winner, uh, and a whole, a whole lot of very talented black people, and they refused them all until one day I went to, and I was, wasn't coming up with anything good, but one day I went to work, and I get out of the elevator, and somebody tells me, hey, Lauren wants to see you in the green room. Sure enough, when I go to the green room, Lauren is looking at the movie I made called Cooley High, in which I play a, a, a teacher named Mr. Absolutely, Mason. yep. Yeah. Yep. Um, by the way, just to get, uh, detract, that teacher is about a black teacher in the ghetto teaching kids in the ghetto, right? Yes. But yep. at that time, I was teaching in public schools on the Lower East Side. I was actually at that time a teacher teaching in a ghetto school, teaching the ghetto kids. You know wow. what? The producer didn't want me for the show, for the movie. Michael Schultz. For, for Cooley High? Right. Although that's what I was doing. I was actually doing the very thing that the part was about. Michael that's Schultz right. had to convince this woman to make, have me do that movie that show and it's one of the best things I ever did anyway getting back to Lauren I go to the green room and he's looking at Cooley High and when he gets through because the other people John Belushi Gilda Radner Lauren Lorraine Newman Jane Curtin had seen the movie and said hey you've got Garrett bringing in black actors he's an actor too and they had him look at Cooley High and when, after that, when I got through, when he got through, he said, Garrett, I want you to audition for the Not Ready for Prime Prime Players. And I auditioned with Gilda, Rad, Gilda Ragnar, Radner. And from that audition, I, I was, he made me a member of the Not Ready for Prime Time Players. That's how I okay. got my first TV, big TV thing. Okay. No, you, you're calling it Not Ready for Prime Time Players. That's what it is. Is, is, is that... Is, is that... What we commonly know of as Saturday Night Live? That, to this day, that's the name of the group who does that. Their official uh-huh. name is Not Ready for Prime Time Players. Wow, I, I did not know that. Yeah. I would think it is just Saturday Night Live. That is, from the very beginning, that seven-member group was called the Not Ready for Prime Time Players. Get out of here. Yeah. Okay, and, and it's interesting because I wanted to get into this part of, of your story. Lorne Michaels, th- yes. this guy's a legend. Yes. You know, I, I didn't realize that this is how you were introduced to him. And when you first came in to work with him, you were working as a writer. Right. You weren't necessarily in front of the camera. Right. There's another story to that, by the way, because I was mad at anger at myself that I couldn't get a skit going that was like 30 seconds, 15 seconds, because I was a playwright who was used to writing two hours, two and a half hours, right? Mm-hmm. So I, and I thought it would be easy and it wasn't. But finally, I came up with an idea that came from the play. Because in the play, the um, a Black Panther group, which was named Young Lions, in the play they called mm-hmm. the Young Lions, not Black Panthers, used to make a joke about how when they went out to collect money for, you know, from people who supported the group, that they'd always get more money when there were more white people there. And they realized that white liberal guilt was the reason why they were getting this money. So they would always be joking about white liberal group, white liberal Christians and Jews who had a guilt complex were, in fact, supporting their group. So it was a great joke. And mm-hmm. I told one of the guys about it. His name was Tom Schiller. I didn't realize he went and told another guy. I'm going to call his name Alan Swibel. Uh, not Alan Swibel. Alan Franken. 
And Franken wrote the joke as if it was his own. Oh, man. Give me no credit for it. Wow. Yeah. And actually, it actually happened on the day that I went to the green room to, for, to see Lauren seeing Cooley High. Mm -hmm. On that day, I had to come in mad as hell, and I was going to let Alan know how I felt about it. Now, Alan Franken, I don't know if you know, in Harvard was a wrestling champ. No, I didn't know that. So yeah. maybe you might not have wanted to take that too far. Well, I had a black belt at the time, but I knew he would whip my ass. <laughs> but I didn't care. I, I was going to make sure he remembered the fight. I was going to make sure he remembered the fight. And sure enough, the only thing that stopped me from carrying that through was when I opened that elevator, somebody said, Lauren Michaels wants to see you in the green room. And in the green room, I cooled off and realized that Providence had given me something better. So I never, ever, but yeah, because I would, you probably wouldn't be talking to me right now had I done that. Because I'm reminded did, did of Did you another, ever confront him in any kind of way and say, look, I, I know what you did? I was never confront him, no. He may have seen a couple of interviews, because I've, I've told this on a couple of interviews, so he, he probably seen a couple of interviews. Yeah, he deserve it. Yeah. He he deserve it. it. You you know you know why why we're talking about the not ready for prime time players, aka Saturday Night Live. You know that that show has been on now for something. I mean, it's pushing fifty years at least. Yeah, we had the Friday Sixth Anniversary about oh a few years ago, and I was there. Yeah, so so this show has been on forever. You are literally part of the original cast. Yes. Uh, you you mentioned John Belushi, Jane Curtin, Gilda Ratner, uh, God bless her soul, Dan Aykroyd, yourself, Chevy Chase. What was it like to? And, and matter of fact, Lorraine Newman. Yeah. What was it like to work with these legends? They all went on to do amazing thing in their career. Yes. L yeah. Uh, Lorraine and I see each other uh, for dinner dates uh, even to this day. Jane is a beautiful woman. I'm going to be at a something celebrating her in a, a few weeks. John, I loved him. He's a great man, you know. Toward the end of the five years, it seemed he changed his whole attitude towards me. Um, I don't know why. Gilda is the reason why I have this job. I had got the job because uh, one of the things that impressed me about um, the members of the Not Ready for Primetime Players was their improvisational ingenuity. Uh, they had been to Second City, and I was amazed at their range, how they could just take anything and had such a range for making stuff funny. Now, I was in a workshop too, but not like Second City. I was in a workshop conducted by a guy named Dick Williams and another guy named Gilbert Moses, brilliant mm -hmm. black actor and director. But in the black workshops, you were dealing with problems like teen pregnancy, uh, police brutality, what the white establishments are doing to black people, all of that. So my range didn't, uh, the second city range went, went from like one to a hundred. My range from being a black workshop went from like hate whitey to kill whitey. That was about it, okay? And so I was having problems really hooking up to them. My rhythm was always off. And I always, to this day, I recognize that and admit that. But I was so impressed. Kind of, sometimes I would just be impressed with what they were doing. I would forget, oh, you got to be in it too. Mm -hmm, uh, mm -hmm. So I was very impressed with the improvisational skills of John, Gilda, Lorraine. Lorraine's from the Groundlings, yeah. So it's uh, uh, my good friend, uh, uh, Jennifer Coolidge, who was in Two Broke Girls with me. Yep, yep, yep. Yeah. Huh. Uh, and off camera, was John Belushi as wild as he seemed on camera? Now I got to get into uh, my dope using days. Am I allowed to do that? <laughs> yes, you are. He and I both were very much into cocaine. And um, more than once, John would come knocking on my door. And I would, you know, open up the uh, aluminum foil and let him hook up. And John would go from one end of the aluminum foil to... 
And by the time we got through, I had 10% of what I really had then, right? So for about two or three years, we were good friends. But then he got this manager, whose name I will not call, uh, who I later on found out was an absolute racist. And John's attitude toward me changed. Because I do believe to this day, I might have been a blues brother. Because John was always telling me, there's a project I want to talk to you about. There's a project I want to talk to you about. But he never got a chance to. Because when he got this manager, he stopped talking to me about it. Oh. And the reason why I know this manager was after me, because when I left Saturday Night Live in the 80s, I found out through gossip that this guy was actively telling people not to hire me. Are you serious? I'm serious. For did like did four, you ever do anything personal to this manager that no, you know of? No, no. I found out from a friend of mine who was the star, one of the black stars, I'm going to call the name of Love Boat. You know what I'm talking about. Yeah, yes. He was doing the same thing to him. And cause for a long time, I really d didn't know whether to believe it or not because gossip is a gun thing, right? But when my friend, he said, man, he did the same thing to me, and he gave me a rundown of what happened with him too. So I did a lot of horror movies during the 80s for like mm -hmm. oh, five or six years. You know, I got a whole lot of horror movies, mainly because I could not get people to hire me. By the time the 90s came in, something happened. This guy had died, I think. And that's when, uh, you know, when I hooked up with uh, the, the Jeffersons for a couple of years. Um, and I hooked up with um, Rock. And I hooked up with um, 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 Martin. And later on, Jamie Foxx. So you believe this guy who we will not name in this interview, you believe that when he passed and can stop, for lack of a better way to put it, blackballing you or closing doors, that's when things started to open up for you. I can only, look, I know that's what happened. And look, I'm telling you. What, was I, he that powerful in Hollywood? If I told you, if, if, if people have heard me say he was John Belushi's manager, they will know who I'm he gonna is. I'm going to look it up. No, I'm going to go look it up. He was very powerful. I didn't know how powerful he was, right? And when I heard my friend, who was one of the stars of Love Boat, the black star of Love Boat, uh, say he'd done the same thing to him, then I said, okay. You know, I didn't know why, but this man, uh, because he was a Jew, right? And mind you, when I came from New Orleans, my view of Jews was very positive because I was aware of the fact that a whole lot of Jewish lawyers put their careers on hold to go down south and help with the civil rights movement. So when I went to New York, I had that in my mind about Jews. Of course, I got to New York and I realized that it wasn't all that way. You know, it wasn't all that way. Um, one of my experiences in New York was that I went to a, um, rent an apartment on 74th Street um, between Central Walk West and I think St. Nicholas and the Jewish landlord. I went to that apartment, I came and I said, well, I'm sorry, it's already been rented, right? So I called, at that time, Eleanor Norton. You know who Eleanor Norton is? In Absolutely. DC, uh, had, she was young then, had been hired as the head of the rental department of New York, something like that. So I called that department and said, hey, I think I've been discriminated against. They said, give us the name. They said, okay, Mr. Martin, we're going to have a white checker. Go and see. Sure enough, the white checker went down to the same landlord and was given the apartment. So then they called me and they said, Mr. Mars, you were right. They said, show up on Monday morning by 10 o'clock. We'll have a lawyer come and he'll take care of it. Sure enough, 10 o'clock was there waiting. A short black man said, you Mr. Mars? I'll tell you, he said, wait here. He went down and talked to the lawyer. I know what he told him. He probably told him something that you violated the law. You couldn't be sued, all of that, something like that. Mars, you got the apartment. I went and that's when I got the apartment. That took me out of my naivete about 100% of all Jews. Mm -hmm, some mm -hmm. are very much on the left side, some are very progressive, some sensitive to the racial thing, and some are not. Yeah, I mean, while we're on the subject, I believe I speak for you as well as all of us. Our hearts go out 
to what's going on in Israel right now. Oh yeah, right, definitely. Yeah, you definitely. Know, what? Why, why would they attack? Why, you know, they're there. You're not gonna get them out. They're gonna be there. You know. Yeah. And I think they are much more efficient at this than the Palestinians. I believe. Because remember, on, that only one war that didn't start is because. Israel figured out and stopped it before it even started. The six day thing, remember that? Yes, We're back absolutely. There. Yeah, yeah. But like I said, you know, I, my, our hearts it really, you know, this this uh, this world we're living in, man. You got to stay in prayer. Yeah, and to see innocent people just lose their lives, lives for nothing, man. For nothing. I mean, I I'm not, you know, I, I'm definitely not. If if nobody. If you attack somebody, they're supposed to attack back and attack over the top. So I'm definitely for saying, despite what I just said, you know, I, I'm definitely on the Jewish side of this. And in my career, despite what I said about that other thing, you know, uh, I've had a lot of support and help from Jewish friends of mine. So it's not something I, I understand that's not a, believe me, uh, the, the experience with the Jewish lawyer was only one part of New York. Yeah. You know, and I did look up while you were talking, John Belushi's ex-manager. Yes. I, I won't say his name. I could put him on blast right now. But, okay. Uh, you know, he's he he's dead and gone. So right. I guess we have moved a conversation on. Yeah. You know, I want to go backwards for a second, because before you got Saturday Night Live, you, you and here's the thing. You have been in, it, it almost seems like every uh, relevant, every classic, every one of, of these black cast movies or television shows that I can remember in my entire life. You mentioned some of them, Martin, Jefferson's, uh, Jamie Foxx show, uh, and, 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 and I want to talk about Cooley High, because Cooley High, that would, to this day, that is considered a clap. Matter of fact, even before I go deep into Cooley High, weren't you also in Car Wash? Yes, I was, yes. <laughs> <laughs> every black show, every black movie or show that is a classic within our community, somehow, some way, you was in it. But anyway, let's talk about Cooley High for one second because I I don't know I don't know a uh, 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 person of color that that didn't grow up loving this movie. If you from if you a boomer, if you a Generation X, if you a millennial, it's almost a rite of passage to watch Cold Cheese and Preach and the rest right. of the crew. How how did you get cast for that role? Like I just told you, I was a teacher teaching on the Lower East Side. I was, in fact, a teacher teaching on in the ghetto, teaching ghetto kids. And the role of Martin, uh, Mr. Mason, was that very thing. Michael Schultz wanted me to do it. And the female producer said, no, she wanted a uh, Sidney Poitier type because she had seen To Sorrow With Love, To Sorrow With Love. Mm. And he had to convince her to let me do it. And by the way, Michael Schultz, a genius, in my opinion, um, was working on shoestring economically and also with casting. Stone and Roberts, the two black guys in that show, in the, uh, yep. Cooley High, the one who mm -hmm. basically is the reason why Coach Heath was dead. Yep. He saw them walking down the street one day, Sean. And he called us out. He said, hey, Gary, y'all come, come and check it. Look what's coming around the street. We said, yeah. See, that looks like, I'm going to see. And he, he called, he said, hey, guys, have you act, ever acted before? They said, no. He said, good. I want you in this movie. That's how story Are you serious? I, I'm absolutely, it's the absolute truth. They had never acted before. And to the, one, one of the guys, as a matter of fact, I think Stone was shot and killed about 15 years after that. Roberts is now an actor himself, still in Chicago, uh, working with uh, uh, one of the ladies who was in the show, Jackie, working with mm. her. She has a, um, a um, uh, acting a, a house herself, you know, a theater herself. 
but she got you. Yeah, yeah, you know. Got gotcha. you. But yeah, but that's uh, Michael. In my opinion, his genius on that movie is over the top, man. Over the top. Let me ask you something. Did you know? Because obviously, you're a young man at this time. Um, and, and you're struggling, you're, you're trying to get work like most actors. Uh, you, you, you just want to keep adding to your credits. Right. Did you know that that movie was going to become the classic that it's become? No, I didn't. But I also knew Michael Schultz. Okay. He had already had me in a play called, um, Moon on Monkey, Dream on Monkey Mountain by a great playwright, uh, Derek Walcott from the Caribbean. And I was amazed at what he had done with that. And also mm -hmm. I seen him do a lot of the things at the Negro Ensemble Company. So I had no problem thinking that it would compete well with other movies. But I didn't uh, know that it would become what it has become. You know, for for that time, it was unprecedented. That movie grossed uh, over thirteen million dollars right. for it to be a that. small production. That. Yeah, that movie grossed over thirteen million dollars. That that was big money back in oh, seventy five. Yeah. D -d -d do you ever either bump into or keep up with um, Glenn Turman or Oh or my God, all the Lawrence time, Lawrence Hilton Jacobs, all the time. Matter of fact, Glenn. Can I say this? It's Go going ahead. to produce a thing, a documentary about Michael Schultz and me in about a week or so. Are you serious? I'm absolutely serious. Glenn is one great actor that I truly yes, he admire. Is. When he played, by the way, the role of an 18-year-old, you know how old he was? How old? 28. But, but you know something, that, wasn't, this, that wasn't unusual back then. Huh? That, 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 was, that wasn't unusual back then. But hey, then. tell my good black not cracking. Come on, Sean. <laughs> That's almost <laughs> 10 years older than the role. Yes, yeah. Okay? And he did a brilliant job on that. Uh, yes, he did. I, I still everybody think, know Everybody know Preach. Right. I still think one of the most tender romantic scenes is him and the girl getting down. In the bedroom, remember that? Uh huh. <laughs> yes, I do. <laughs> and to think you remember it? Yes, yes. That yeah, was and I'm gonna tell you. I'm gonna tell you another thing. My, we talking about black don't crack, but my God, you how old are you now? 80, 86, You said? Eighty six. Yes. Ain't nothing wrong with your memory. <laughs> like I'm sitting here listening to you. We having this conversation. I'm, I meant to bring this up earlier. Huh? You remember every detail, huh? every minute detail. Huh? Yeah, huh? Huh? <laughs> I'm trying to make a bad joke, Sean. I I got it. No, I caught your joke, sir. I caught I, oh, okay, I caught your okay. joke. <laughs> huh? <laughs> You you know something I should have asked you this um when I was talking to you about SNL o on that on that first uh season of 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 Saturday Night Live yeah Richard Pryor he was featured oh what, what, yeah he was okay now now you just told me that um you and John Belushi used to have a time during your cocaine days. Yes. Richard Pryor is notorious. He was deep into it then. And though Richard to this day is my number one monologuist, period. I know Dave Chappelle is great. Eddie is great. Tracy is great. And definitely there's a woman named Lunell. Oh, I, you know Lunell is a friend to this channel and 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 she's on this channel all the time. Brilliant, brilliant lady. But yes, she to is. this day, Richard is my number one monologue. Yet when he came to the show, I'm going to blame cocaine and what it does. He didn't treat me the way I thought he would. He brought his own troop. And at that time, I didn't realize that the position I had was really being looked on at every black person all over the country. I didn't really take that in consideration. So a lot of them, except for people on the East Coast, nobody knew about me. Nobody on the West Coast, South, nobody knew about me. 
So I was being treated as Lorne Michaels' nigger who nobody knew about. And he took that to heart and brought his own troop. What, what, what do you mean he brought his own troop? He brought it on, on his own group. He didn't use me to do anything with him on the show. If you see that show again, you see I never do anything on with him. However, later on when he did a movie called Critical Condition, yep. uh, he had um, his director to call me and he offered me a, a cameo role in that movie. And he never said, hey, I apologize. And he never said anything. Like he just did that. And that's when we met and became friends. Wow. Yeah. And it's interesting that you share this story because I would think, especially during the 70s, and it was so few of you guys in show business, I would think that everybody would be sticking together. Everybody who who uh, had any level of power would be trying to pull up the next person who they see, okay, you know, I know how difficult it was for me to get the spotlight. Let me reach my hand out and pull up the next young brother. Let me, let me say something, because uh, I'm critical of myself as well. There's some decisions I made on that show, that when I look back, I could have made better decisions. And a lot of people looking at stuff and applying the word, and as a matter of fact, one comedian, I won't call his name, who I, Lauren Michael called me one time and asked him what I thought of him, right? And mm -hmm. I said, hey, I saw the guy in Philadelphia, he was beautiful, he was very funny, very funny. Now, his manager certainly had a lot to do with him coming on, but, Lauren Michael did ask the opinion of the people on the not River. That group, all seven of us, he asked John, he asked me, and he asked anybody who had seen this black comedian what they thought of him, including me. So I told him I liked him. Hey, bring him on. When he came, I went to meet him, and I happened to start to say, hey, man, we got you on. He said to me, you didn't get me on. My manager got me on, you Uncle Tom. Hold on. you know, I know you won't call him by name. Was he a cast member? No, this guy was, at that time, Saturday Night Live was having comedians do uh, 10 minutes, five minutes uh -huh, in uh -huh. his show. They don't do it anymore. But, uh, for instance, one time they had Billy Crystal, another time they had another, and this time they're going to have this black comedian, whose name again I won't call, very funny man, very brilliant man, you know. But his opinion from what he had seen in the show was that I was an Uncle Tom. And he told me wow. so. Wow. Yeah. How, how do you even react to something like that? No, knowing where you come from. Bro, it broke my heart. I remember went into my room, and for the first time, I broke down. Because those, those especially, you know, you coming up out of the 60s, we, we, we as a people are fighting for civil rights. Right. You're from the South. You're right. from New Orleans. So you know racism firsthand. Hey, man. <laughs> so to be called to your face of Uncle Tom, that, that must have really broke your heart. Let me tell you something. I was born in 1937 when uh, black men were being lynched. I told you not just three times a month, but two, three times a week. By the time I was 10, I was a black boy who knew that might be my future. I participated in marches. I participated in all kinds of protests before I even left New York City uh, and, uh, and left New Orleans. Matter of fact, when the buses were, were desegregated in New Orleans, I and another lady were the first person. To get, it, was, it, it was desegregated at 12 o'clock, 12 a.m. We got on that bus, right? And all the way home, uh, white people throwing bricks at us, sticks at us, cause all kinds of names. When I got to New York City, uh, uh, one thing that uh, acted equity and SAG and all of them, they were not, they didn't, they want you, they want desegregated. People don't realize there's a lot of protesting that desegregated SAG, certainly a lot of protesting that desegregated and acted equity and all of them. And it took a lot of marching and all of that. From, from black actors during the 60s to make that happen. I was a part of that. Also, I wrote a play, as I told you, which was about 
examining a black cop, a black cop who in fact had infiltrated the uh, Black Panthers, and I was one of the first members of Leroy Jones's Black Arts Theater. Right, we got raided all the time. Before Imama became, well, before he became Imama, we got raided all the time, Sean. Matter of fact, I left after the third raid because I was sick and tired of seeing cops coming up the steps with shit, guns over their shoulder, right? So I said, look, I got to go. I don't know, did one time somebody might shot. So my last thing is to be an Uncle Tom. And when this guy called me that I realized that my comedic decisions on TV were quite often quite abstract. I don't know if you mean by, uh, I don't look on the left side or the right side to do something comedic. I will do something that is comedically satirizing black or white. And that's really what I was doing. If it's, if it's going, for instance, one thing, I, one thing I did one time, I was going to do it with a Michael Don, O'Donohue, uh, because at that time, black uh, civil rights groups was sort of publicly vying for who was the blackest. You know what I mean by that? Yes, I do. So, well, I, b I believe I have an idea. So I was going to portray a black man who was so against white, he didn't even want black teeth. <laughs> thank you, thank you, Sean, for laughing. <laughs> and we had this black toothpaste, right? We got, and sure enough, not only did a couple of the guys, uh, black guys who were in the crew, threaten not to work that week, one of whom I'd gotten the job, but the NAACP sent me a letter protesting something that didn't even happen, but because my attitude was, if it's going to be comical, I don't care if you're black or white, I'll make fun. And I'm sure that attitude led to people misinterpreting what my organic thing is. I am no way, in no way, Uncle Tom, you know. Uh, I, if I tell you my leftist feeling, the FBI might call me in a room, in that next room in a few minutes. No, I, it, you, can, can I take a guess on who that black comedian was? I know you don't want to say his name, but but if if, if I name three names, can you just tell me if he's one name of them? Name three names, and I'll tell you. Yes. You, you, okay. Coming to mind, I I, I uh, what what what's what, what's old boy's name? Um, uh, Bill Cosby. Who was around in that time? Bill Cosby was around. It wasn't. Uh, it wasn't something who was well known. No. Okay. So 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 if it wasn't somebody who was super well known, George Wallace, maybe. No, and George would not do that. George is to this day, me and George, and I think he's the funniest motherfucker in the country, okay? <laughs> <laughs> he is you, a okay. funny, funny man. No, George, George is hilarious. hilarious. But I'm trying to think of who would call you that because, because you mentioned, and, and you, you mentioned with reverence, um, Dick Gregory, so I, I know it wasn't Dick. No, it wasn't Dick, no. Couldn't have been, been him. Um, I know Flip Wilson was around, but he's well known. Oh no, it wasn't anybody who uh, who had a name. Okay, so so this guy's I'll still not. I leave this it guy's alone. still known. You would know him if I called him. He's known among professionals now, but he never became to the stature of Dick or Flip or anybody like that. No, and and, and you know you mentioned your play several times uh, in, 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 earlier in the conversation. And um, how it was infiltrated, the Black Panthers were infiltrated. And and, and I, I couldn't get, Fred Hampton is is the name I've been trying to uh, but think Fred of. Was not, Fred was the guy who was killed. He was the guy who was killed by, and, and, and William O'Neill. Because O'Neil, of that guy's work. William O'Neill was, was the guy who infiltrated the Black Panthers and okay. later killed that, himself. And he, at that, that time, the story, it was in magazines every once in a while. There's this guy going around. He's hiding in different places. And I started saying, wait, this guy's about my age, and he cut from the South. I know he knows the real deal. And now he's an agent for white people in black groups doing their shit. I say, what must be he be thinking about? He cannot be 
have a restful mind. He's got to be having trouble with that. So uh, my play was about, it is about the nightmares he would have, uh, you know, about doing that. You know, and how yeah, yeah. What, what William O'Neill was 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 the guy? Yes. They actually made a a, a, sure, a, movie. a great movie, a great movie with yeah, uh, Judas and Kaluja, Judas Kaluha. and the black. What's that black the uh, guy from Africa? Did, Dan, Daniel 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 Kaluha, uh, Yeah, he played a great yeah. movie. Did a great did yeah. Great, well, it, it's a, it's an amazing movie. Yeah, um, sure I think it, I forget it what it's called. Something in the Black Judas, Messiah and yeah, the right, Black Judas. Right, right there, you go. Right. All right. You know something? Before I move this on, you were on SNL, I believe, when the young Eddie Murphy ca came, came on. after me. He came after he me. He came after you? Yeah. Okay. You never got a chance to work with him on, on SNL? Not at all. No, not at all. Okay. We talked about car wash. Yes. Now, you know, an another classic film within our community, but but I I, I want to focus not so much on the film itself, but the actors that played in it. Um, you know, Richard Pryor was in the film. Bill Duke, who you mentioned earlier, yeah. George Carlin, or Antonio Fargus. Yeah, you you and so many of these legends go back so far. What was it like working with these guys? Did you know that these guys were legends in the making? Oh man, believe me, I was just. So great to be in that company. Uh, Tony Fargus, I fell in love with his portrayal of this character in um, 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 Great White Hope. Did you see him in that? No, I didn't see him in that. Oh, uh, 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 uh. my God. He kicked ass. I just know him from Starsky and Hutch. Oh, no, no, no. You should have seen him in The Great White Hope. He played like an interlocutor. Is that the word to use? Could every... After every scene, he'd come home and comment on the scenes. That was his role. And I'd never forget him uh, doing mm. that role. Plus, later on, he was in Dark and Hutch. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Bill and I were friends way back there because we had done um, the, um, Imam Mu's play, Slave Ship. And we had gone to uh, Europe to, in fact, bring that uh, play to Europe. Uh, so, as a matter of fact, being, uh, Bill and I participated in well, a, a, a rebellion of a cast uh, against what the producers were doing in the production of Slave Ship. Because in New York, the producers were violating a whole lot of rules, and so we decided we can take it. And when the second act started, we all stood up and say, hey, we, and we told the audience why we were producing, and we walked out. Sure mm. enough, in Europe, we had to do the same thing to a producer in Zurich, Switzerland. And why did we do that in Zurich, Switzerland? Because the producer happened to be the, the brother-in-law of the mayor of Zurich. And he <laughs> put out he put out a 72-hour alarm for our arrest. And Are you, you said niggas got out of Zurich by plane, bus, carriage, <laughs> or, or running any way you can think. You had niggas getting out of Missouri, okay? <laughs> and, and I don't use the word N word uh, without thinking about it, because we got out of there, man. <laughs> oh, man. All right. But um, yeah, Bill know. Duke and I were still friends to this day. Matter of fact, he had, we had a lunch together yesterday. Uh, um, who else? So you well, still keep in touch with Bill like that? That y'all had lunch together just yesterday? Yeah, me and Bill have lunch all the time. Yeah. He was at my 80th birthday thing. Another, another one of the great black actors, another one of the great actors of our time. And I and I don't want to I don't want to put y'all in a box. Yeah, one, oh, yeah. yeah, like like let, let me just give the, the flowers you deserve. Uh another one of, of the great actors of our time, Bill Duke. Wow. Yeah. How about that? Talk about Glenn. Have you seen him in the uh Bayard Rustin story? No, I forgot mm -hmm. the name of it, but uh, I'll I'll take you the name uh, if I can um, when sure. I get when I get. But I saw it the other night at the uh, Directors Guild. Great uh -huh. story. Had the new black actor I've never seen before playing him, and they are real about by because you know he was gay. Yes, yes, he was gay and black and leftist, which is the worst thing you can do in the fi forties and fifties. Let's face it. 
But Correct. I didn't know until I saw the movie that not only was he brilliant, which I always thought, but he was the the march on Washington was his idea. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah, and he was the main one who got it together. Oh, I did not know that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Huh. Okay. Um. You know where do I want to go? You know. I, 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 let me pit stop here for a second because Vlad, Vlad just interviewed Todd Bridges on the same platform. Uh-huh. And you had, you had a regular role on different strokes or you had a reoccurring yes, character did, yeah. on different strokes. Yeah. You, what was your thoughts? Well, it wasn't on a regular role. Set. I think I did a few of some episodes. You did a few That's, episodes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Well, you said what was Todd's story? What? What? No. What was your thoughts? Me, because those different strokes kids, they they were they were celebrated. Uh, Gary Coleman was probably one of the biggest young, yeah, s- stars. Period. Not right. just a you black said, star. Now you said what was my what? What was your thoughts on on? Meeting those kids, uh, Ga- Gary Coleman, oh, Todd I Bridges, I, Dana Plato. I was a Gary Coleman fan. I was a, I was a Gary Coleman fan, uh, the late Dana Plato. I was a fan of the show, and I was happy to be on it. Yeah, I was very excited, you know. And at that time, Gary was at the height of his thing, you know. Yeah, I mean, he he. This guy was was a level. I mean, th- th- this yeah. was a child actor. But to see the way all of their lives turned out, Gary Gary Coleman made somewhere upwards of $18, $20 million on that show. And he ended up broke. He was working as a security guard in a mall before his passing. I was told, I'm sure you were told, that his parents were basically responsible for that. Yes, yes. That that was the the, the word that went out into the world. Yeah. Um, you know, but it's so sad to see how his story turned out. Dana yeah. Plato, same thing. This was a woman who, you know, uh, I, I, I remember hearing the 911 call where a convenience store worker said, hey, I was just robbed by the girl on different strokes. Why? And, and she ends up dying of, of overdose. Right. Uh, you know, Todd Bridges himself, you know, he has battled and struggled with drugs Dana Plato, who played Kimberly Drummond on the show, had a hard time yep. a- after losing, um, you know, after losing a role on the show. Mm-hmm. In 1991, she went into a video store with a pellet gun and robbed him. <laughs> the, the, the guy behind the counter called 911 and said, I've just been robbed by the girl who played Kimberly on Different Strokes. I yeah. mean, literally, he was like, I know who you are. She's yeah. not wearing a mask. Yeah. Were you in contact with her up to this well, point? Uh, uh, I went and helped testify for her in court. And uh, that's why I ended up relapsing. I was two years sober. Uh-huh. I was two years sober. Um, I went in there and, man, that prosecutor beat me up so bad, I went home and got high. Huh. He made me feel so low about myself because that was his job, was to discredit me, you know, understand. He did everything he could and threw everything at me and but everything up that I went through emotionally and mentally, and I ended up relapsing huh. after that. I ended up going back out because of that reason. I wasn't, I, I found out that I wasn't, what I realized was I should have stayed away from it. I wasn't ready to help anybody. I couldn't help myself. I was hanging on, barely hanging on myself. You know, and that was the dumbest thing I ever did. All right, because that next year in 92, you're 27 years old. Yep. You got arrested for suspicion. 26. 26, sorry. You were like arrested on suspicion of transporting drugs for yeah. sale and possession of a loaded firearm. Yep. Back then, like I said, I was a I was a, a kid. If you think about this, my father was also abusive growing up to me and my mom. So if you think about this, you're you you can't find anybody safe. Hmm. There's no one safe. Yeah. I didn't have my father safe. Me and my mom were weren't, we were safe when we weren't with my dad. When my dad was there, we didn't feel safe. When I was out on my own, couldn't feel safe because I was getting harassed by the police. Mm-hmm. When I was at the studio, they couldn't feel safe there either. I couldn't. I had nowhere to feel safe. So um, I carried guns, you know, I thought that would keep me safe, you know, and, and like we all learned, it's just, it's something that makes you unsafe, you know, and then, like I said, I had relapsed and I had done drugs again, you know, and because I had no real program. I had no real program. Wow. Could you see any of that within those kids back in them days? No, I didn't. I didn't. I didn't see that at all. And I thought, because if you see Todd at an earlier, earlier time, 
you would expect him to be because he was a number one child actor. Number yeah. one. Yeah. Yeah. Hmm. Um, you also was on another one of all of our favorite shows, um, sitcom The Jeffersons. Yes. Oh, I was delighted to work with uh, Sherman and Isabel, man, and Roxy Roker, and uh, yep. Carly's, um, um, ah, Marla Gibbs. Oh, that was a great time, man. And I was directed by a great TV director who had been around Negro on Summer with me, uh, Negro on Summer Company, being ignored. His name is R. Scott. Do you know who that is? No, uh-uh, I don't. R. Scott is one of the greatest television directors today. You should check him out on, on your computer when you get home. He directed this thing called Black Lightning. Okay. Yeah. Um, but he directed, he directed, um, and for those, um, for Colored Girls on Broadway. Yep, yep. That was his directing of it. He was the one who directed that. Very nice. He directed, I think it was Moving with Sidney Tyson and Richard. I think it was Moving, Busting Loose, Busting Loose. Mm -hmm, Busting mm -hmm. Loose. So he's, a, he's one of my great friends. But, um, um, oh, shucks. Yeah, but when I first did the um, Jeffersons, the first, see, the first show I did, I directed it, and I was delighted to be working with Sherman and with Isabel and with Marla and Roxy. It was a great, great time. Two years. A lot of people don't know that. I had two years as a regular on that show. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I remember it well. I used to watch that show all the yeah, time. Yeah, You 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 know something? You mentioned being black, being, being gay, and being leftist was not a good combo. Oh, my God. You, 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 there, there, there were long-standing rumors that Sherman, you know, he he was in the closet for the for the better part of his life. Yes, he was. Is this something that was commonly known amongst you guys, or or did you just find out in the aftermath? I knew about it. I knew about it a long time before it came out. Yes. Really? Yeah, I did. That guy was such a comedic genius himself. He sure was. He he really was, and he carried that show. He and, and went on to do Amen. Right, such a funny guy. You know, it's just unfortunate that during those times, it, it just wasn't socially acceptable. Right, to 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 be gay, to come out and live your truth. Uh, you you would be cast from Hollywood, and especially if you was black. In a certain way, it's still the best to keep that. Sort of, yeah, on the down low. Yeah, even now, because if you're yeah. a white actor, you can let it out, but if you're black, let's face it, that double standard is going to come in. Correct. Yeah. You know another show that I loved you on. You had the opportunity. You mentioned Marla, and she went on to play in Two Two Seven. Yes. You you had the opportunity to work with her in Two Two Seven. Uh, what did you think? Because that's where I want to go. What did you think about young Regina King? Did you could you see the brilliance of that young girl? And I, and do you, know, you I, look at her and marvel? I don't want to sound like nobody who's saying something about the future. But I I used to yeah I I saw the energy, but I never knew she'd become what she be, has become. That I never knew. But I did see something different in her. You know, I did. Yeah. You know, it, and she, um, <laughs> she's another one that shares a very similar story to yours because all of the movies that, that I came up with, the hood movies, she was always in it. Yes. Playing the low, you know, hood chick from the hood and Hello. this, that, but to, to see where she has grown and, and, and to eventually win an Oscar, right. an amazing story. Right. An amazing story. But and but you know something? And and again, my heart goes out to her because it doesn't come without a shared tragedy. She lost her son a few years ago. Oh my god. To to suicide. Yeah, her son um to suicide. So oh my our god. hearts I didn't go out that. to her. Yeah. Oh yeah. Yep. You know, huh. it, and, and and I can keep going down the list and I'm trying to pick and choose. 
the roles that I just loved you in. But you played you played with Charles S. Dutton in the in the Rock. I sure did. Yes, I sure did. I, uh, how, I, how'd you I get cast it. for that? I, lo- I loved it. I loved it. I loved it. You know, and knowing that where you know I, I was proud of where I knew he had come from. He had been uh, in the joint, and now yep. you know he was. You know, I loved it. You know, hanging out with him, I did. Yeah, I mean, um, that, that's another guy who really, really showed that that where your life is today, um, because he, like you said, he was in the joint, he was locked up for many years on a manslaughter charge. Yeah, and and to come and have a, a show that that you are the main character in, you're a black man in Hollywood. That just don't happen, and it just shows that perseverance and and, and commitment and dedication. You can overcome anything. Keep on believing in yourself. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Martin. Well, (laughs) let me say about Martin. Martin, first of all, brilliant, funny man. I was delighted to work with him. I only had three years, but with the three years, I was one one of the greatest casts I'd ever been with. Look, you had beautiful, talented, great singer, uh, Tisha Cannell. Uh, yep, Campbell. Tisha Campbell, and also great, beautiful, extraordinary singer, Tashina Arnold. Yes. The late, brilliant Tommy Ford, great actor Carl Payne, and one of my best friends to this day, the white guy, one of my BFFs right now, Jonathan Grice, who was, remember the, the white guy who was my Engineer in the yes, uh, radio Yeah, station. of course, yes. Yeah. So it was a great cast, and I'm delighted to this day. People will call me Stan, you know, or or Junior, you know. Now they add Earl to it, but one of the names I'm called all the time is Stan, and that's because of that show. You know, and I'm thankful for Martin hooking it up. You 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 know something in that show, I mean, because the show how do I say it? It kind of mirrored what you was going through in real life. You you actually got shot in real life. Yes, I did. And then they picked up you kind of being on the run from the cops in the show. Yeah. For, before we even get to that, how, how did you get shot? Well, I was, um, this is not like, you know what Crenshaw and Florence is in New York? In New York? Yes. yes. Okay. There was a friend of mine who lived on 11th Avenue and 67th Street, which is a block in from Crenshaw. And he um, used to do the cars, you know, to do the cars, right? Brush them down. So I went to have my car done. But when I went upstairs, he was talking to somebody. So I said, you hook up your conversation. I'm going to go downstairs and get something to drink, right? I'm going to get some orange juice. Now, I always know to keep my eye out. Even though I'm born in the ghetto, I still know, you know, I'm short, five foot six. You know, weight and height count whether or not somebody's going to attack your ass, right? <laughs> so, yeah, if you're smaller and you're a little older, and I was about 57 then, and I'm, you know, five foot six, but I make the mistake. Going down the bottom, because you, the commodity, would be with me. His name was Commodity, the guy I went to see. Go down to get my car, and two people come towards me, and I go past them, and I don't realize they turn around. Now, one was about five foot nine. Let me say this, let me digress. Uh, my friend Glenn told me he met the guy who said he shot me, and that guy was about my size. That guy was trying to get a reputation. Because the guy who grabbed me was about, when I turned around, he was about 5'10", something like that. Six feet tall and maybe 20 years of age. Now, what he didn't realize was, although I'm old and 57, I had a couple of skills. I'm a first degree black belt. And when he grabbed me, stuff from the dojo came into my mind. I did it. I embarrassed him. Why? Because on the other side of the street, was a gang of people who had been saying, hey, Stan, hey, Stan, hey, Stan, hey, Stan. So I'm 
embarrassing him in front of these people. When mm -hmm. I turn around, that's when I see the gun. I didn't know he had a gun. Had I known he had a gun, I wouldn't have done anything, right? Had he come to me like that with the gun, I'd say, hey, man, whatever you want. Take my clothes, take my money, take my car. My wife's at home. Go get her. I would have said all of that, right? He, when I turn around, I see the gun. That's when I say, hold up, man, hold up, man. And now he's thinking, this guy is trying to challenge me with a gun. He shoots. He goes to my arm, then to my um, uh, my abdomen, um, which caused me to have a colostomy for like eight months after that. The bullet ricochets and winds up in my lumbar fire which after about 10 operations, it had to be finally be removed. So basically, that's how it happened. This guy come, grab, here's the reason why I was able to do it, because he grabbed me strong with the left arm, right? But the mm -hmm. gun was loose, because he had the gun there. So the little thing I did, which embarrassed him, I was able to do only because he didn't grab me real tight. And he grabbed me real tight, you know, he's, about 5'10", he weighs more than me. I wouldn't be able to get loose. So he's thinking I want to fight a gun, which, and believe me, again, I would never. If you come, if you point that gun at me, you can have whatever you, I got. You know, I'm taking out mm -hmm. my clothes, my drawers, mm -hmm. my money, everything. So that's basically what happened. This guy, and his name was Tiny Duke. And the way I found out was a few years later when I'm going to Lake uh, Lake. Uh, there's a park that's on um, Barham Boulevard. You go down by Barham Boulevard, um, there's a park, right? Um, and I'm walking it around the park. Then I'm able to walk because for, for a couple of years I was in a wheelchair. Then I had a cane. Finally, I was able to walk. And a guy who works for the DWP says, we got him. We got him. So I said, what are you talking about? He said, I was behind the wire when you got shot. I said, really? He said, yeah. He said, uh, uh, we got Tiny Duke. And apparently, some of our fans were behind the wire when I got shot by him and showed him they didn't appreciate it. <laughs> Cause, <laughs> yeah, because a couple of times, uh, they uh, let him know they didn't appreciate it. You know, But that's how it happened. You, you know something? Do you, do you think that he recognized and knew exactly who he was robbing and shooting at that time? Well, let's see. I think he wanted this leather jacket I had. It has, it's a leather jacket that has Africa on it. Uh-huh. It was a brilliant leather jacket. I believe that's what he was going to make me give him. But you have a very I don't familiar know. face. I don't know. I know the guys on the side of the street were saying, hey, Stan, hey, Stan. Uh huh. Uh huh. So I don't know if he, because he was on the other side of the street. It was him and a girl, by the way, him and a girl who did this. So I don't know if he recognized me or not. Oh, I thought he was with another young man. You no. said he. No, he was a girl, short, a girl. She was short. Get out. Yeah. Well, you you know, I, I I didn't realize that the that the bullet traveled. In the way that it did. Oh, yeah. It went you, to, are, you are a blessed man that you, you're you able to walk to this day. Right. Well, I can't walk. When when they took the bullet out, the doctors told me, you won't be able to walk or run anymore. Well, they lied about the walking. Because from 1994, when it happened, till about three years ago, right, Kay? Mm -hmm. I was walking. Now I need a, a walker to walk, and I mm -hmm. walk with a cane. So it came true with both of those things, but from 1994 to 2020, uh, I was walking. Uh, so um, I'm lucky, talking about what you said, I'm lucky that the bullet didn't ricochet and hit my heart. Because yeah, quite often, yeah. bullet ricochets and goes into your heart. Man, you tell me God ain't good. Yeah. Wow. Okay, you, and, and again, I could do this for days and days and days with you because we are naming so many classics that you 
starred in. You know, we just spoke about Martin and you go on to work with another Oscar winner, Grammy winner, A-list Hollywood star, Jamie Foxx. Oh, yes. Oh, my God. That was <laughs> one great time, man. I love working with Jamie and Garcelle. Coach, I couldn't concentrate, concentrate with Garcelle around, okay? <laughs> right? I had to keep my on the script, okay? Uh, on my friend to this day, who played Braxton, Christopher Duncan. Yep. A brilliant, brilliant actor. That motherfucker can play Ox uh, uh, Shakespeare without thinking about it, and he can play an OG in the hood without thinking about it. He is one brilliant, brilliant actor, and I will go to my grave saying that, because I think he's just brilliant. But what you, Christopher, Garcelle, Jamie, it was just a great time we had, man. And Jamie would have you laughing because a lot of times, not all the times, in between sets, he wouldn't go to the dressing room. He'd be making jokes and stuff, you know? And a lot of times I would miss going to, the, to the, my dressing room to hook up the next scene and learn the lines because I'd be sitting there to listen to his ass, you know? But, <laughs> oh, yeah, Jamie, Jamie. It was great work with Jamie. And um, matter of fact, I only worked four years or there was a five-year thing, and in the first year, Jamie didn't have me or Chris or Garcelle, but he paid us. Are you serious? I'm telling you the absolute truth. We so, got so for checked. that fifth season, he changed. Remember, he changed to the office. Yes. Okay, he yes. had Garcelle, right? Because Garcelle yes. and him had a relationship going. Uh huh. But Chris, I believe, was no longer on the set. Because he changed it to the office where he was this jingles writer. Yep. Mm -hmm. Right? And he and Garcelle had a thing going. Uh, so she was in it. But I wasn't in it anymore. Elia wasn't in it anymore. Yeah, and we still got paid. Now, now is, is because again, we spoke about, uh, you know, black talent reaching their hand back and making sure that they take care of black talent. Was that a decision made by him as the star and executive producer of that show? I'm to say, to look, I want to make sure that these guys get paid? You said star executive producer. You tell me. If you're the star and the executive producer, you can say no. You want to know something? These are the stories because pe people, people, uh, they obviously know Jamie he has an amazing voice. Yeah. Like I said, he 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 has had some tremendous records. Uh won a Grammy. Yes. You know, he went on to to play Ray and won, won an, Oscar. an Oscar and Academy Award. But these are the stories that people need to hear. Yeah. To understand that that outside of the star power and outside of the celebrity there's a human being yeah that wanted to make sure yeah my people are being taken care of right so right. i love hearing stories like this right because i'm sure he was thinking you were gonna do five years and i'm like this next year don't worry i'll hook you up anyway how dope is that do, do you ever get because i know he fell sick recently do yes, you ever get I, to, to to reach I out sent to my uh, i sent my it could do all of that, but no, I, I didn't get any response, and I, I have no problem with that because Jamie is surrounded by a lot of people doing a lot of stuff, you know. Got you, got you. Okay, uh, another friend of this channel who who is a regular commentator or, or a regular contributor to content on Vlad TV is Mr. D.L. Hughley. Oh, <laughs> yeah. I did uh, his show. I did a couple of episodes, I think, you know. Yeah. I yeah. love working with him. I think he's one of the funniest men around. And I like that he doesn't mind telling the political truth with his, with his com comedy. Uh, uh, you know something? I think he's actually more known for that at this point. Yeah. Because he stands on his political truth. Oh, my God. And he is not afraid to tell it. To say, no, he's not, not afraid at all. Hey, you tell it like it is, you don't give a damn who hears it. I like that a lot. You have played so many of these incredible characters 
over the course of your life and you're known for being part of the cast of so many of these shows and movies. Is there any cast or or character in particular that out of all of them, you can pick and say, this was my favorite? Wow. And I actually it wouldn't be a... Um wouldn't be a sitcom, man. It's going to be something on Broadway. Really? Which? Which one? Never Mind Peoples, Ain't Supposed to Die Natural Deaths. That's your favorite? My favorite role. Next to Mr. Why Mason. So? Next to Mr. Mason and Cooley High. Those two. Okay, why so? I, because, and the reason I ask, because both of those are pretty much in the beginning of your career. Right. Ain't Supposed to Die was one of the most brilliant um, assaults on the white establishment in such a political, um, poetic way. And it was directed by a genius by the name of Gilbert Moses, and it had a cast, 10 of the most brilliant actors I ever worked with, and I call myself lucky to have worked with them because with a cast like that, you didn't have to really do anything but ride on their energy. So once you got on stage with that cast, you just sort of accept what they were giving you. And by the time you got to your role, you didn't have to worry about that. You would, it would come out. And for me, I had a guy, a brilliant musician named Harold Wheeler, who was responsible for the music. By the way, Harold, um, if you saw that um, the dance thing, remember the dance, dance music, the dance, give me the name. What, Dancing with the Stars? Yeah. What are we talking? He was the yeah, director okay. of that for like 20 years. Yes. yes. That's, that's Harold Wheeler. Right. Matter of fact, we do, I, we had his house about two months ago just to check him out because he's, he's under the weather now. Um, um, and we're going to see him in, in uh, December, me and Glenn and them, because we love Harold. But Harold is music, uh, Gilbert's directing, uh, and uh, Ben Peoples' poetry, along with that cast, I was just so glad to be in that cast and the energy that that cast gave me when I got to do my part, I just just rolled on what, what, what was going on until that point. I it, it was not, you know, you had to stretch or do anything, you know. And with, uh, with um, um, Mr. Mason, same thing. Because, you know, I had Glenn Turnman, had uh, Larry Hilton Jacob, uh, you know, I mean, poof. Uh, I was just lucky, fortunate to have those two great casts. You know something, you you speak about great casts and great actors, and, and great directors for that matter. You, I mean, you've been in show business for over 60 years now. I mean, it, it legitimately over 60 years. That's true, that's true. I was born when the road was flat, Sean, so, you know, you should understand, I would, you know, <laughs> thank you for the laugh, Sean. It took you a little while. Okay. It took me a second yeah. to get it. <laughs> I got you. You I know, to say, I, I got my gone. Is this my gone? <laughs> <laughs> I'm a little slow sometimes, but I got it. <laughs> I got to ask you is there anybody that you haven't worked with during the course of your career that you look at and say, I really wish? that I had the opportunity before it's done to work with this person. And, and it could be an actor, a director, it, it could be any. Oh, man. Who was it that did uh, Blackish? Anthony Anderson. Anthony Anderson, I love to work with him and Tracy. And one time, um, um, damn it, I forgot the name of the director. He threatened to have me on it. I've got the Say name of that director. You get, hook it up. You go, search for his name because uh, he wanted me and Sam Jackson uh, with me as the grandfather, of course. Jackson as Anderson's father and to do an episode on that. You, you're not talking about Kenya Barris, are you? Who? Kenya Barris. Yeah, yeah. That, that's who you're referring to? Yeah. Kenya really... The word was out that he told some somebody on some show, but well, what would you like to do? He said, I'd love to have Garrett Morris and Sam Jackson uh, come on and play uh, father and grandfather. 
Mind you, wow. me as a grandfather, Sean. <laughs> You, you know, you know. I asked you that question because I, I gotta imagine the 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 reverence that that I have for you. Oh wow! There are so many actors, uh, 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 directors, people who are aspiring to to reach the heights that you have reached in your career. They have the same reverence for you, and. Wow. For, for for one day, Kenya Barris, uh, uh, Tracy Ellis Ross, Anthony Anderson, to hear that I would have that that you were thinking of them and would have liked to work with them, that has got to be such an amazing accolade for them. Such an amazing that 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 the the the, the man himself called me out you you could have mentioned tyler perry you could have mentioned spike lee you can mention anybody on planet earth and, and you chose them i love that well well i first saw anthony do you know he did a show i think it was done in australia i forgot the name of it oh gosh i ought to be ashamed of myself that's when i first saw him right and i saw him evolve because then he was on um uh la law not la law um Law and, hey, order. Order. Law and Law order. order. I saw him do dramatic. I saw him do comedy with dramatic, with, and then he comes back and knocks it out on, on the comedy side. You know, great respect. And Tracy, when she started off with that other show, my girlfriends, remember? Mm -hmm. Yep, people, girlfriends. People yep. used to criticize her because they were crediting her career with Diana Ross, her mother. Correct. And she she showed them, hey, no motherfuckers, I can act. You know, uh, so. I respect it. I like that a lot. And I was honored that Kenya uh, should even have said that because that was said, I know it was because people have repeated to me more than once. Amazing. And the reason why I like Blackish because the title of it, I said, what's this title about? Then I realized the title was dealing with the actual fact of Black in this community. Here's what I mean. Black in this community is not a biological term. It is a cultural term. Because black goes from, and you know what I'm talking about, from absolutely white people who are yep. white and people who are like me and in between. Most white people in this country don't understand. When you say black, you mean somebody who's passe blanc. In New Orleans, you know what I mean by passe blanc. I mean yes, passe yes. white. You mean people who are actually biologically white who are out there enjoying white privilege and when they go home, they go home to a non-white family. That's what black is in the community. It's from that to yellow to tan to brown to people like me. And that show showed that. Yeah, you know? it really did. Yeah, it really did. It, it touched a lot of uh, very sensitive topics, right. and and it brought it out in a way that right. that was humorous. But you know, it 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 exposed a lot of things that go on behind closed doors right. that we all know about, but it's not normally put out there. Right. Like I said, you've been doing this for over sixty years. It is hard as hell. I saw an interview with um the great Robert De Niro once. And, and he was talking about being an actor. Mm -hmm. and, and he was saying how difficult it is to just keep a job. He was like, I don't care how great you think you are. Every actor is always looking for the next job. Yeah. That, that's, that's really what your job is. Yeah. Auditioning and looking for the next job. That's true. What, I, I, you've been doing it for over 60 years. What is the keys to staying employed in Hollywood? Because clearly I I, you I figured I, it out. I wish I knew. <laughs> Come on. Look, I know way back there when I started with this positive thinking thing, um, one thing that kept me with a certain kind of positive attitude was that. Okay. Um, not the fault that you'd have downtime, but I always believed in myself. And, uh, you know, and for me, that's the only thing I could say to somebody, you know, is believe in yourself. Never ever think you're going to lose. Always believe you're going to win. 
I don't care how down you are, always believe you're going to achieve it. Always. And I've had times when, not just weeks, when a couple of years have gone by, when I've not, I've worked with like sparsely. Then I've had times when I've worked for the last time up until, actually up until the end of Two Broke Girls. I worked straight for like at least 20, 20 years. Okay. Amazing. I mean, Amazing. Yeah. But that's unusual, right? Um, uh, like I told you, there was a time when not only was not working, but I knew somebody was acting aggressively to see to, that it didn't happen. And I didn't stop believing myself, but I did feel pissed off that I was choosing to do horror movies during, <laughs> during the 80s. <laughs> <laughs> Matter of fact, one of those movies is called, oh, shit, help me. Oh. The, you the wasn't stuff. in Friday the, the 13th? Or? No, The Stuff. The Stuff. The stuff, the stuff, got you. Yeah. Uh, and it's a cult movie now. Mm -hmm. uh, but, um, uh, you know, only about 20, 25% of actors are working at any given time, Sean, which is why I'm pissed off about how SAG is being treated right now and how the producers of about that streamer thing, you know, uh, just held out so long. Uh, because producers, not all of them, come from business schools where they're not interested in the art. They're interested in money and shareholders. So they would even damage the artists. SAG right now has producer types that are damaging the very people from whom they're going to make money later on when this contract is done. They should be treating them as if, hey, you're part of how we're going to make money. They're not. They're treating them like our shareholders, shareholders are number one, we're number two, and you actor, you're not even tertiary, even four or fifth, you're number 10. That's really what's going with SAG right now. So in this business, yes, you have to believe in yourself very strongly and be willing to deal with even what seems like the lowest times with an attitude of I'm still going to win. I don't know how you do that, but I know in my situation, I find it hard to get to it, but I got to it, you know? Mm -hmm. And it's not that I wasn't crying sometimes, particularly when I had a wife on two occasions that had to deal with come money and to pay bills. But uh, for me, I know it would be hard for people to hear this who, you know, right now are not working as an actor and have to work uh, two and three temp jobs all the time, you know? But I had to do that myself when I first got to New York. Correct. So uh, the only thing I can say is simply, simply never stop believing in yourself. I know it's hard to do, but try to make it something that is systematic, that you always get up and believe in yourself. If you, I'm a Buddhist, we do it through chanting. If you're a Christian, do it through praying to Jesus every morning. If you're, you know, uh, Muslims do it through hooking up Allah all the time. If you do, check out Yahweh. And of course, with the, the, the Hindus, they have 10 or 12 people. <laughs> Krishna, <laughs> Krishna, Vishnu, Brahma. But if you have any spiritual life, grab on it every morning and every evening and make that how you keep your inner life up and positive. You know, and for me, that's, I don't know how De Niro does it, you know, did it. Uh, and it's easier when you have a little money in the bank. I'm blessed that I do have a little money in the bank, okay? But still, that the way in which you've been working on a certain thing, even if you have money in the bank, you're not working, that affects your mentality. It affects, you know, you, it, it, you know what I mean? It does affect you. Like if suddenly you couldn't do what you're doing now for whatever reason, I don't care what half money you money you've made, there's a thing in you that wants to do what you're doing. And that Absolutely. needs, not just wants, that needs to do it. You know, it's a, it's a part of your religion now. It's a part of your spiritual life now. And that's what it is for people who really are dedicated to acting, who've gone to acting drama, because a lot of people go to drama school, okay? Those just people, a lot of people go, that's dedication. You go to drama school, four years, you know? That's drama fucking school. That's dedication, you know? So, 
if you're dedicated like that, you deal with people who have gone to business school whose religion is shareholders and making money and not the art. You've got basically someone who's saying to you, I want to make money from you, but I'm going to treat you like shit. That's all. I'm, I'm, I'm through. <laughs> And, and, and with that, I'm through because I, I, I can't even top it. <laughs> we we, we going to end it there. Keep believing in yourself no matter what comes your way. Right. The, 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 the art to longevity, it starts with you. It starts with that belief. And I guess we'll end it there. Brother Garrett, this has been my pleasure. Sean, I've enjoyed well. sitting and talking to you and I can't wait to do it again. Sean, remind as well. And like I said, if you're going to show this in Louisiana, I got to go in hiding. <laughs> well, go in hiding because it's going to definitely show in Louisiana. Okay. But, but, but I, I, I truly believe you ain't going to have to hide nowhere, Brother Garrett, because you have been a blessing to this world. Wow. Keep wow. doing your thing. We love you, brother. I love you too, Sean. Thank you, man. Peace, man. Don't do anything I wouldn't do. And with that, I'm giving you a lot of room, Sean. <laughs> <laughs>